The first significant connection occurs in utter darkness in a passageway between a sperm and a lone ovum. Usually about nine months later, a human infant is born prematurely. Why do I say prematurely? Because at birth, humans have only 25% of their brain developed. Our primate cousins have 75% of their brains developed. So that while the initial connection is absolutely necessary, it is utterly insufficient. From the get-go, what has to happen while these little critters come from the factory with amazing apps, they are absolutely helpless. And if a connection with a caretaker is not established, the dumpster is the alternative. There is no survival. And whenever there are no options, a curious thing happens. We idealize what it is that we have. We don't need an option. We've got the best. Because when you compare it to the dumpster, literally and figuratively, as you know, uh, it's always better. So a whole panoply of cues are learned from the caretaking, and usually mom and the environment, a whole panoply of cues that I'm calling needs, with a capital N, to distinguish them. Those needs are invested with survival. The only other time that that paradigm of no option and idealization should ever occur, it should never really occur, the only time it does occur is in a hostage situation with susceptible individuals where there's a regression to your life being totally dependent upon the terrorist. And in that situation, there's an idealization of the terrorist that occurs, and it's been called the Stockholm Syndrome. So that whole panoply of needs are vital. If you think about the last time you saw a toddler at Macy's, when mom disappears for a moment, he might as well be on the Gobi Desert, because though surrounded by caring, concerned people, there isn't the familiarity of the cue, and he's utterly panicked in terms of survival. So if we take a peek inside for a moment, the, the brain, you've seen other pictures of it today, the outer cortex, of course, is the neocortex, it's what makes us human. Going backward evolutionarily, we have the mammalian brain, uh, midbrain structures, and then we have the earliest evolutionary aspect, and I want to call your attention to it, of the reptilian brain. There are 100 billion neurons in the human brain, each capable of thousands of connections. So we've got trillions of connections. And remember I said that we're born with only 25% development. So the rest of development occurs in the interaction with the environment. And it occurs in a use it or lose it fashion. More fancy, it's referred to as Hebb's Law. That is, neurons that wire together, fire together. If they don't, they're lost. And so I like to joke with uh, moms, nervous as they sometimes are about newborns, that they are committing bloodless neurosurgery on their newborns. The way we go to grow is that we start off as children, and I'm using this also as a child state, that has these needs. These are very powerful needs, as I mentioned, capital N. There's also the beginnings of an emerging adult. That adult is gradually gaining experiences and maturity. Then in blue you see the adolescent, and often you hear in one sentence of an adolescent uh, the autonomous expression and the immature dependent as they are growing to adulthood. And then in adulthood we have predominantly the adult state of mind, and I characterize that with a capital W, want. Those needs that are desirable, like ethics, honesty, morality, are chosen if they're desirable and converted into wants. But since none of us have perfect children, childhoods, uh, there are no perfect people, so there's no perfect childhood, there's always a residual of a childhood conflict that varies by genetics, by constitution, by environment. But there's always a remnant 
of a conflict in uh, us from the past. That is the need and the want. Let me go into some characteristics that differentiate these two states. These are very powerfully different states. I want to call your attention first and foremost to analog versus binary thinking. Analog is a dimmer switch. Between on and off, there's a whole range of choices. That begins in early adolescence. The capacity for analog thinking begins in early, in early adolescence. Pre predominantly up to that point is binary thinking. On, off, yes, no, up, down, good, bad, me, you, I'm right, you're wrong. This is where prejudice, demagoguery, fundamentalism, either of a political or a religious nature, thrives prejudice particularly as well. I'm right, you're wrong. I can't be wrong because my survival depends on it, so you have to be wrong. Additionally, in the characteristic, I want to uh, differentiate and call your attention to vulnerable versus helpless. We learn as kids as if they are synonymous. Children are helpless. As an adult, we should never experience helplessness. We may be profoundly vulnerable, but never helpless. What's the difference? Choice. Options. A child has none, an adult always does. And I have to tell you the most powerful example of this is United 93 on September 11. I have no question that some of the passengers curled up in a fetal position and died childlike. I also have no question, as we know, that there were those who chose the inevitable and in making that choice, were empowered. They were enormously vulnerable, but boy, were they empowered. Just to continue this list of some of the characteristics of difference between adult and child, there's always been this tension between what we desire in real time as adults and what a part of us says we must hold on to, what we need. That tension has always existed uh, ever since humans could take an hour not to worry about being eaten or what they were going to eat next. So that tension has always been there. What makes it particularly important at this point in time? Well, I think there are three things, actually four, but I couldn't figure out the acronym for it. Um, <laughs> the the uh, first is media. Never before in human history, as opposed to Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun, never before in human history has everyone in the world been able to know or let others know what's happening at any place in the globe. That's never happened before. And we see governments working toward trying to control the internet because it is so powerful as a means of communication, as a means of connection. The second thing that is new, if tribe A wiped out tribe B, tribe C, 20 miles away, didn't even know A and B existed, while C is busy wiping out D. But we now have mass extermination. We can now wipe out everything but the cockroaches, apparently. And I add survival of singles, because in the first world, that is a new phenomenon. I think the fourth thing that I haven't figured out the acronym for is global warming. And I think we have to include that. So if we then take a look, mirror, mirror on the wall, guess who's in the most trouble of all? And I think Walt Kelly said it very, very well. Because what he said was, we have met the enemy, and it is us. I mentioned earlier that reptilian brain. Einstein commented, this is a picture of the same person, by the way. <laughs> Einstein commented that it is appallingly clear that our technology has vastly outstripped our humanity. So that if a caveman picks up a rock and smashes his neighbor's head open, or if a starched uniformed officer, beribboned as he is, biometrically gains access to a room, unlocks a panel, enters a code, pushes a button, and an ICBM goes and destroys a city 5,000 miles away, all we have done is increase the quantity of the kill. We have not touched the quality of a relationship. We are in the world today like a sandbox in a playground with very large 
childlike people whose toys can turn the sand to glass and the people to ash. What's the remedy? Well, here are some remedies we can implement. In general, strive for the adult state of mind in ourselves and in others. Recognize and counter binary thinking. Look at what's going on with this fiscal cliff, to mention something very contemporary. No compromise. Compromise for the binary means capitulation. No negotiation. There has to be a right and a wrong. So counter wherever you encounter it, binary thinking. Encourage the scientific method of inquiry. It is under threat in our schools. And the valuable aspect of the, of the um, scientific method is it challenges us to look at our assumptions, test those assumptions, and let go of old beliefs and risk new ones, which means we must welcome uncertainty. One of the definitions of maturity is the ability to tolerate ambivalence. For God's sakes, endorse secularism. Regardless of what your belief may be, this country was not founded on a hyphen. It was founded on humanistic basis, not religious. In order to prevent the tyranny of any one religion dominating any other or preventing people who choose not to believe. So for the sake of your own faith and the growth of whatever your faith may be, endorse secularism. And recognize, last but not least, the value in a mistake. A mistake means somebody's moving outside of the box. Is taking, maybe the world isn't flat after all. They're taking that risk. A Nobel laureate once said, the wonderful thing about a mistake is it comprehensively teaches you what doesn't work. Thank you.